Hi, everybody. Welcome to this public forum on pesticide use in our community, hosted by the Environment and Natural Resources Committee of the Local League of Women Voters, Northern Lower Michigan. I'm Robin Jordan, Local League President. We have a really robust and active environmental committee, and we're really pleased to offer this public forum. This presentation is being recorded, as you just heard, and will be made available on our YouTube channel. The link will be on our website. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the League of Women Voters, we are a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. The mission of the League is to empower voters and defend democracy, and we have vital work to do. Diversity, education, equity, I'm sorry, and inclusion are central to the League's success in creating a more perfect democracy. Anyone over the age of 16 is welcome to join the League and membership is free for students. We, um, information about the League is found on our website. Our local League also acknowledges the land that we serve as the traditional territory taken from the Anishinaabe tribal nations. And we honor their roles today in taking care of this land. In offering this land acknowledgement, we infirm indigenous sovereignty, sovereignty, history, and experiences. Um, before we move forward, a gentle reminder to stay on mute um, and to please use speaker view so that we can focus on the panelists as they share their expertise. Our moderator this evening is Nancy Duan. She is a co-chair of our Environment and Natural Resources Committee, and she'll get the presentation started. Nancy? Yes, thank you, Robin. As you just heard, my name is Nancy Duan. I live in Petoskey, and I am a member of the League of Women Voters, Northern Lower Michigan Environment and Natural Resources Committee, which brings you this forum this evening. I will serve as the moderator, as Robin said, for pesticide usage in our community, protecting the environment and human health through integrated pest management. This program is part of a larger effort of our committee to educate the public regarding harms posed by pesticide usage. We feel that it is important for both municipal authorities and private individual landowners, property owners, to utilize an integrated pest management approach when there is a determination that a pest, for instance, maybe an invasive species, needs to be controlled or eradicated in order to protect other aspects of the environment. In this way, a balance is created that minimizes the harms of pesticides while allowing for the sometimes necessary control of pests that are creating real and detrimental effects in our environment. Our panelists this afternoon evening will be sharing with you examples of some of these emerging concerns in our region, as well as their expertise in best management practices. To achieve our objective, our committee has embarked on a survey of local municipalities in our three county, which is Emmett, Charlevoix and Sheboygan League region to learn about common pesticide uh, practices. Eventually this survey will allow residents to know who they can turn to should they have questions or concerns about pesticide use and to understand what the practices actually are. Historically, I was part of a local environmental advocacy group called Citizens for Alternatives to Toxins. We called it CAT for short. This group started in 1998 and served the local area for about seven years. Besides providing educational materials and alternative approaches for pest control, we drafted an integrated pest management policy that with the backing of a number of local groups was presented to the city of Petoskey for their consideration. At that time in 2004, the city council was actually very receptive to possible adoption of this policy, but the city management was not interested in what they perceived was a burdensome uh, process for their staff. However, now we believe that municipalities are more receptive to the integrated pest management approach. While conducting our survey, while our committee was conducting our survey, we were pleased and, and somewhat surprised to learn that the city of Charlevoix actually utilizes an integrated pest management policy, which is a written document that is accessible and viewable by the public. 
Our hope is that additional municipalities will follow in practice and policy Charlevoix's example. So today we'll move right on to the program. We'll have uh, five panelists and I will individually introduce each of the panelists before they answer uh, set questions that I will announce shortly. But before I announce those questions, I thought we'd start with one of our panelists, Aaron Lazot. Is that the correct pronunciation? Aaron? It's Lazat, but I'll answer to almost anything. No, thank you for telling me. <laughs> okay, so Aaron Lazat of Michigan State University's Extension Service, and she'll briefly explain why are we concerned about pesticides? What are the risks posed by pesticides to humans, animals, land, and water? Erin uh, is the Integrated Pest Management, correct me, Erin, if I say anything in incorrect. Erin um, is the Integrated Pest Management Educator for MSU Extension Service. MSU Extension's uh, Integrated Pest Management Program collaborates with MSU faculty and MSU Extension educators to develop diverse information serving growers of crops, the landscape turf green industry, and those looking for home and garden pest solutions. So welcome, Erin, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, if I could be granted permission to share my screen, I would, I have a couple slides here just to help me frame the discussion. So, yep, my background is actually in specialty crop pest management, but I also act as the coordinator, which kind of ties everyone together that works in IPM at the university. And um, so I'm excited to be here to talk about integrated pest management. Here we go. Thank you. So hopefully... We'll get this set up the right way. You guys are seeing my slide now? Awesome. So I wanted to just start off and you guys have given me a new challenge, which is to give a five minute presentation, um, but that's good. It's good. I um, really had to pare down what I wanted to talk about tonight. So just the preface that this is obviously not all inclusive. There's a lot more to be said here, but I tried to just get the basics so that we could have kind of a discussion, hopefully from kind of some common understanding of some terminology and concepts. So pesticides are um, a broad term that encompasses materials that are applied to kill, suppress, or repel pests. It includes both conventional and organic materials that we might apply to control pests. And pesticides may be part of an integrated pest management program. So sometimes we use um, we hear people use the term integrated pest management to mean no pesticides, but just to be clear, uh, pesticides are one of the things in the toolbox of an integrated pest management program. And I think the other um, point of discussion here as I was thinking about things were that, you know, generalizations about pesticides or pretty much anything in life can be pretty misleading as characteristics are really variable. So I think when we start to think about concerns about pesticides in our communities, it's helpful to think about which pesticides we're concerned about in which communities and why. So to give kind of context to that. So the environmental impacts of pesticides are complicated because pesticides, again, are highly variable. So there's some different things that we wanna think about when um, considering the environmental impacts. There's things like the mode of action. So the activity of the pesticide itself, is it going to affect anything that makes chitin? So those would be fungicides, those would be insects, or you know, does it stop sporulation um, of a fungi or potentially a weed seed? Um, the method of application can be a concern. So are we using an air blast sprayer in an agricultural field? Are we using a fogger in a backyard? You know, what's the potential for drift from those different types of applications? What's the nozzle and droplet size? Like all of these little calibration things can affect the environmental impact of a given pesticide. We also have to think about the chemical and physical properties of a pesticide, thinking about um, its volatility, its solubility in water, um, you know, is this something that is going to readily leach into groundwater or does it get bound up in the soil? So that kind of goes hand in hand with movement pathways. Are we applying it next to a riparian zone or an area of sensitivity or concern? We also want to think about the application site. So sandy soils, which we have quite a few of in Michigan, are very prone to pesticide leaching. 
but we also have some heavy soils here which are less prone to leaching. So thinking about the adsorption rate of different types of soils is also critical. And then lastly, I included degradation pathways. So a lot of times we talk about pesticide persistence in terms of its half-life, kind of the amount of time it sticks around. Um, but the accessibility of degradation pathways is also really important. So um, as we learn more and more about things like soil communities, we know that healthy soils actually help clean up more than our water. Um, they clean up pesticides. So there are microbes that actually will feed on pesticides and break them down more quickly. Exposure to UV, hydrolysis, there's a lot of different degradation pathways that can be considered. So some of the ways um, pesticides move in the environment that we're really concerned with or aware of um, would include air, which would be in the form of vapor particles or spray drift, um, via water, um, surface runoff, or movement through the soil. And then some other methods include things like residues on plants and animals and sometimes even people. I've seen some perfect footprints on turf grass before where somebody walked through some herbicide and then tracked it onto the green. So um, pretty much anything that can move pesticides around, given the specific application, the mode of action, those things we just talked about, is something that we need to evaluate for risk. So I also think it's really important when we're talking about kind of the hazard or the risks associated with pesticides to address the concept of toxicity and dose. So oftentimes I think we think of um, pesticides as being poison, things like that. There's kind of, again, that generalization, but really the hazard is made by the toxicity level, which we usually refer to as the lethal dose, phase 50, and the dose that we're receiving, whether it's an acute dose or a, a chronic exposure issue. So that is um, what is considered when we're figuring out the hazard of a pesticide from a regulatory perspective. So some um, things to consider here would include the non-target impacts of a pesticide um, to determine the legal parameters of a pesticide, including in some cases the rejection of a pesticide registration based on environmental or human exposure concerns. Karen, yeah. I hate to interrupt, but you have about a minute left, please. Okay. So, um, you know, a particular concern is acute exposure. So one-time exposures that can create hazards. Um, obviously chronic exposure like carcinogenic um, materials is also important. And it's important that, to know that each pesticide is actually evaluated separately for all of these hazards based on the latest standards. And that's renewed every 15 years or less sometimes if there's um, concerns. So just an important note that natural doesn't necessarily mean safe and synthetic doesn't necessarily mean dangerous. So I think now we all know the risk of some pesticides to bees, um, but we may not always think about the risk of pesticides to other plants in our environment, to fish or other wildlife, to humans or really any organism that shares the system. So we can see fish kills and bird kills from the misuse of pesticides or, or poor storage of pesticides. And, you know, probably most famously would be the scenario of secondary poisoning, which happened in predatory birds with DDT and kind of invoked the um, authorship of Silent Spring by Dr. Rachel Carson, which actually led to the formation of the EPA. So this has kind of a long history in our country of having issues with contamination with pesticides, and it's definitely something that should be on our community radars. So I know I'm short on time, so I'll wrap it up there. Okay. Thank you, Erin, I appreciate that. Sure. We'll, be hearing, we'll be hearing from Erin again later. She's one of the panelists, but before we do that, I would like to, to uh, read the questions that each of the panelists will be addressing. The first is, what does integrated pest management mean to you and your organization? The second is, how is it determined that a pest needs to be eradicated? And thirdly, how are decisions made regarding pesticide use? And so we'll embark on the panelist portion of the program. And our first panelist will be Lauren Day of the Tip of the Mint Watershed Council. Lauren joined the Watershed Council in 2021 in the role of watershed coordinator. 
She's responsible for writing watershed management plans, running watershed advisory committees, and dealing with invasive species. Tip of the Mint Watershed Council is dedicated to protecting lakes, streams, wetlands, and groundwater through respected advocacy, innovative education, technically sound water quality monitoring, thorough research, and restoration actions. So thank you, thank you, Lauren, and uh, go ahead and address those questions, please. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for having me here tonight. I um, have a few shared uh, slides to share, so I'm going to share my screen. All right. Oops. There we go. Okay, so what does integrated pest management mean to the Watershed Council? So because we are dedicated to protecting our lake streams, wetlands, and groundwater, um, and with, with that focus in mind, uh, pest management means the control of aquatic and riparian invasive species. Um, aquatic species being anything that's, you know, submerged vegetation or floating vegetation on the water, um, and that riparian area being anything along the lake shore um, or stream bank. Um, and then just to reiterate, though I'm pretty sure we're all familiar that invasive species are non-native species that negatively impact the ecosystem. So the Watershed Council relies heavily on education and outreach. Uh, so we develop education materials. Um, for example, uh, this purple loosestrife flyer that you see here uh, that has information on how you identify purple loosestrife and uh, possible treatment options for that specific plant species. Um, we also do a lot of presentations, uh, for example, you know, one of the reasons I'm here today. Um, but one of the big things that we focus on um, is our mobile boat washing station. Um, this is a grant funded activity for, uh, program for us. Um, and what this is, is uh, we partner with lake associations uh, throughout our service area. And so on just about any weekend at some boat launch in our service area, you'll find us with our, our boat washing trailer. Um, it's a trailer that we hook up to our, our, our truck and we you know, kind of tool it around um, and uh, we'll stop at a boat launch and there we educate um, boat users or recreational users on, the, on what invasive species are and the importance to reducing and stopping the spread. Um, so the main focus of this boat washing, boat washing unit is really to get out there um, and educate people um, as, as its primary focus, um, to really be able to change behaviors, um, to teach people that you know, every time they come out of the boat launch, whether it's one that we're there with the boat washing station or not, that they are actually looking over their trailer and, and doing the clean drain dry steps um, as much as possible. So we're really trying to get them that behavior change as, as a main focus there. So we do a lot of partnerships and collaboration. Um, so with a lot of our invasive species networks, and since Lindsay's here, I'm gonna let her kind of cover that a little bit more. Um, but we do, we work a lot with lake associations and landowners um, and also local governments. And the way that works with local governments is um, when they're developing their ordinances, um, we're usually there to provide support and help them draft language. Uh, there are you know, several uh, local governments that have uh, shoreline protection ordinances and in there, they have language that states they must plant uh, native species over you know, other species like, you know, so there's no, no one accidentally plants an invasive species or plants an exotic species that could be, then become an invasive species. Um, so another one of the best tools in our toolbox though is the monitoring aspect of this. Um, so we can do this through shoreline surveys, uh, which is where we're looking at the shoreline to assess you know, the condition of, of that uh, vegetation strip on the shoreline, whether it's present or not, whether there's increased algae growth. Um, and then also if we see invasive species, we can make note of that as well. Um, but aquatic plant surveys is really kind of where it's at for this. Um, so for those uh, surveys, we're out on the lake and we're um, identifying all the plants that are out there and the distribution of those plants. And so when we're done with that survey, we put together a report for uh, the lake association um, that outlines um, you know, what those plant species are, um, you know, has a map, and that information can tell them whether or not they have a healthy plant community um, and whether or not they have invasive species so they can kind of determine whether or not there are steps that they need to take to eradicate that, uh, that infestation. So with that in mind, that uh, you know, monitoring and those surveys can be really, really useful in the decision-making process. So it's very important to make sure that you have correctly identified your species because a lot of invasive species have a native species lookalike. So it's important that you are correctly identifying everything. 
Um, you also need to know where it's located and how big the infestation is, because these, these are questions you really need to have before you can determine what options are available to you to treat that infestation. Um, I wanted to highlight early detection and rapid response because it is one of the best tools um, in terms of invasive species management. Um, um, knowing or being able to you know, find um, an early infestation of plants so that you can um, you know, respond to it quickly you know, and treat it or remove it before it becomes a bigger deal. This saves both time and money um, and it really is one of the best um, management options. So then you get down to treatment. So once you kind of identify this stuff, like you have to then, you know, kind of go through and see what options are available for that plant species based on those questions that you had to answer. So there are biological control options um, for uh, two, I believe just two for the species that the Watershed Council usually works with, which is purple loosestrife um, and Eurasian water milfoil. Um, the Gallarusella beetles, which eat the purple loosestrife, um, we've had quite a bit of success um, with those. Um, and then milfoil weevils again too, that would be um, for the milfoil that's uh, a submerged vegetation. Then there are our mechanical um, options. So that's things like DASH, which is diver assisted suction harvesting, which is where someone dives underwater and takes what is essentially a giant vacuum and you know, sucks up the invasive plant. Um, and then there's also cutting and pulling. Uh, cutting on its own is generally not um, effective tool on its own, but in conjunction with other, some of these other methods can, you know, can work. Um, there's also benthic barriers, which is basically a giant mat that you lay in the bottom of the lake and it's, you know, smothers the plant. Um, and then there's obviously chemical options. So at the Watershed Council, we always try to see um, if, you know, any of these other options work prior to going to the, you know, the chemical treatment route, but obviously in a lot of situations, chemical treatment is sometimes you know, going to be the most effective um, option for treating some of these infestations. Um, but again, we try to go um, try to see if those other options uh, will be the, the first um, or if those are uh, feasible before going to the chemical option. Excuse me, Lauren, um, you've got about one more minute. Yep. And I believe that was it for me. Um, so I'll take questions when we get to the question time. Um, but I'll go ahead and send it off to the next person. Thank you, Lauren. Appreciate that. I uh, appreciate your, your time. And like you said, we'll have some questions later. Our, our next panelist is Dan Bissonette. And Dan, please tell me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, Dan Bissonette is of Dan's Green Side Up. Uh, it's a uh, Harbor Springs-based professional lawn and landscape care company that offers an environmentally sound approach to management of private and commercial properties. Dan is a licensed uh, pesticide applicator for the city of Harbor Springs, and he has a degree in golf course management. He's also a master gardener. I believe Dan is here. I think I saw. Yes, I'm here. I hope you can hear me. Yes, thank you, Dan. Is your, is your last name pronounced Bissonette? You did great. You okay. did phenomenal. Boy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, allowing me to speak today and, and um, and thank you for the introduction. I kind of do not have any slides. The, uh, the ladies did a fantastic job uh, basically describing what we have to deal with on a company. Um, you, you gave us three different questions to answer and I'll try to do my best in the short period of time. And I'm always open for questions any time of the day. Um, one of the, the first question was, what does this IPM mean? to my organization, my company. Well, I have children and grandchildren, and as we all know, that is the uh, very important, that's probably the most important decision I have to make. What am I gonna leave to them? And how do we get to this point of uh, reduction of the inputs that we're doing? I do this for a living, been doing it for 35 plus years, and, and uh, uh, most of my uh, time spent in the business world has been near Lakeshore. And, and at the end of the day, you cannot replace what we have in the state of Michigan, let alone the Great Lakes. So what I try to do in the IPM is work on a long-term prevention of pests. And in, in my specialty is, is turf grass, but it can pertain to pretty much any living uh, plant that we grow. Uh, first, Lauren mentioned biological control. There's beetles and weevils and, and uh, in the turf grass world, we deal with grubs and, and that sort of thing. So those are our options I have to consider. 
Um, when we're looking at a uh, property, um, um, I always look, can I manipulate that habitat to favor a healthy plant? Um, what can I do that would be a lot easier than applying? I look at applying as, as one of the evil necessities in our business. The next thing I look at is cultural practices. Somebody had said before that, that soil are, is very important. And, and the first thing I look at is when you build a house, what do they do with the soil? It's pretty much everything that comes out of the ground and, and actually gets put back. It is what it is. So I have to consider what is the slope? Where is it going? What is the end result of whatever I apply if I make an, an application? So watering, meaning if there's a, an irrigated property or a non-irrigated property. There's two different uh, sets of rules that I apply when, when attacking those situations. I also put um, another one is use resistant varieties of, of turf grasses or other plants. What can I use to reduce water inputs, fertilizer inputs, uh, pesticide inputs, be what they are? Um, how can I make that plant the healthiest plant in that system with the minimal amount of inputs. That's how I attack it. I don't know how um, most homeowners attack it, but I have to be uh, uh, certified in up-to-date in all my education of each individual category. So what I look at in each individual property again is the environment, what that pest or pathogen may be, and, and what is that host? What, how, how is that being affected? Um, we've kind of, I think everybody's had that uh, a situation in the last two years of we're the host and we have a pathogen. How can we change our environment, manipulate that? These are the questions, again, I look as a part of science that, that we've all had to experience in the last two years. What are we gonna do about it now? So that kind of answers that second question of how do I determine when it needs to be eradicated? I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes it doesn't. I look at some lawns and it might be one to five dandelions. I'm okay with that. Other people aren't. And I have to uh, figure out a way to make everybody happy from uh, that pest threshold. We will probably talk about uh, in, in a few slides. And it, it's based on either economic um, or aesthetics. Uh, economic is when that pest can ruin a lawn or ruin a, a, a whole host of, of uh, crops, if you will. And um, that's how that I make a decision when I apply it, when I finally make a decision to apply a pesticide. I try to go and attack it from, uh, if I lived at that place, how would I do it? How would I want my lawn? I have four grandchildren. I'm going to leave them something better than what we had before. And it doesn't always involve an application. Um, can we live with a higher height cut of lawn? That is a huge thing that I battle on a daily basis. Everybody wants a golf course, but I'm telling you a golf course is expensive. And it's not always necessary. And we're in the golf world. We're finding out how to do it better ways of reducing our mode and maintained area and still give the end user what they want. Um, I'm hoping there's an acceptance by the public because the public drives what we do. It always should, and it always will. And I look, I, I actually entertain that as a, a, as a company to, to do better than the last. Um, there are other things that I try um, to understand when the homeowner or property owner manager, what have you. I look at quality, cost, and speed. And if I can have two of those three and they're happy, that has a, an effect on it. Um, sometimes quality comes at a, at a cost. Um, most people want it fast. And usually when they call me, it's, it's because there's a problem. I try to prevent those problems. I think any good manager does, um, any good environmentalist, and environmentalist does, uh, their best part. And I don't know where I'm at with time. I would uh, entertain any questions later on. I, I uh, appreciate the time you've allowed me to speak today and apologize, I don't have a photo or anything you, like that. 
Dan, you did great on time. <laughs> oh, you. you're awesome. Thank you, Dan. That's wonderful. Thank you, All right. So our, our next panelist is Lindsay. And once again, help me with the pronunciation, Bona Egg, Eggman. Is that correct? Okay. All right. So Lindsay's from uh, Sisma Cake. Lindsay is this organization's program coordinator. And once again, correct me if I'm wrong, with a 14 year career in invasive species management and a degree in forest resource management from the University of Montana. Yep. Now, Sisma Cake, I'm going to do the quick uh, summary and you can uh, fill this in, but a lot of people wonder what that means. It's an acronym, and Sisma stands for Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. And the cake portion refers to the, the region that, that you serve, which is the four county area, Charlevoix, Antrim, Kalkaska, and Emmett. The group was formed in 2015 by local organizations passionate about the management of invasive species and increasing public awareness of about current environmental issues. These organizations include natural resource focused nonprofits, land trusts, and county conservation districts. In collaboration, Sisma Cake serves all communities, natural areas, and landowners in its four county jurisdiction through public engagement and education. Thank you for taking uh, the time to help us understand your, your position and your organization's position, Lindsay. Sure, thank you. Um, I apologize, I have a cold, it's not COVID. <laughs> it's just a regular old cold, so I sound funny. Um, but uh, I am rather new here. I moved to Michigan in October, so I apologize if I don't have all of the answers for you. Um, my coworker, Katie Gray, is also on the call. If um, there's any questions that I can't answer, um, she is one of our field technicians and our education and outreach coordinator right now. Um, so she has uh, more hands-on experience in the field here and in, um, in the cake service area that she can help me answer. But um, you know, the mission, you did a great job, um, you know, describing what we do. Uh, we're a very collaborative um, organization. It's grown out of um, you know, the desire of a lot of different people and organizations to have a, a specific focus on invasive species. Um, and the mission, you know, our mission reads uh, that we are gonna protect natural resources, the economy and human health in Northern Michigan through a collaborative outreach and, and the management of invasive species. And I think um, that collaboration is the bigger piece of what we do. Management is a secondary piece. Um, we have, like you, as you said, we have a steering committee of, um, it's made up of seven, seven members, and then we have partners that um, number into the 20s. Um, the steering committee is made up of the Little Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa Indians, the Tip of the Mitt, um, Little Traverse Bay Band of, uh, uh, Little Traverse Bay uh, Conservancy, Grand Traverse Conservancy, Antrim County and Kalkaska County all sit on our steering committee. Um, and that committee has helped guide um, our decision making on our invasive species management. Um, we have a strategic plan that we follow. Um, and in that strategic plan, we also have a prioritization um, plan for our species. So since 2015, um, we've kind of developed a strategy because um, as we all know, there's quite a few invasive species here in Northern Michigan and we can't, we can't get them all. There's not enough tools in the toolbox. Um, so we've uh, five species have risen to the top that we are um, really concerned about um, or at a threshold like Dan was talking about that we can hopefully get get some control on. They have enough of an ecological impact that we're, you know, concerned that we're going to um, go to those hard hitting tools like pesticides. Um, and those, uh, those species for those who are uh, interested are Phragmites. And um, you'll notice a theme here with a lot of them being riparian uh, species. Purple loosestrife, also a riparian species. Um, Japanese knotweed can be a, a um, riparian species, although uh, that one's more of a just a harmful species. You know, it can terrorize foundations and whatnot. Um, oriental bittersweet and then black swallowwort, and black swallowwort being one that's um, kind of localized in northern Michigan to just the Petoskey area although I did hear that they found a pretty good patch in Traverse City. 
um, black swallow wart we're concerned with because it is um, toxic to animals and humans. Um, and it also is uh, a, a lookalike for milkweed um, and monarch butterflies will uh, mistake it for milkweed and it's toxic to the butterfly larva. So it, it's actually, you know, an additional threat to our um, poor monarch community. Um, so we're, we've been targeting that species pretty heavily um, for the last few years. Um, and so as far as, and then the secondary approach that we're taking other than the species approach is a habitat approach. So um, we are, have started a process of identifying um, threatened and important habitats in our um, service area um, through some GIS modeling and then working with an organization called the Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Um, they're a, a, a branch of MSU um, and they do, uh, you know, threatened and endangered species inventory work and plant surveys. And uh, together with them, we're going to develop a, a plan to uh, manage the uh, the really important coastal and riparian habitats that we have, um, as well as uh, any of the other, you know, habitats that come come up through this surveying. Um, to protect those areas um, from invasive species. So recognizing that those are really important. And a lot of those sites that we've already determined um, happen to be, like I said, coastal and riparian habitat. Um, those seem to be our really critical areas that we need to focus on. Um, so with that being said, um, Integrated pest management is a, a super important um, approach that I would say most invasive species managers take. Um, the, uh, the tools that we end up using most of the time because we're using because we're we have identified um, important species that we are work trying to eradicate. It tends to be a chemical approach. Um, but with like, for example, the black swallowwort, we also pull the seed pods and we do a lot of education and outreach in those communities, talking to them about pulling the pods. Um, we have licensed applicators. Um, and so everybody's certified and all up and up on that. Um, Excuse me, Lindsay, you've got about a minute. Okay, um, I'm just trying to think of, I, what, if I, can I share my screen so I can show you guys some of my, uh, imagery here. Um, this is a preliminary map identifying um, the, the habitat that I was talking about, um, some of the critical areas that we are going to focus on to try to keep the invasive species out and keep the um, ecological integrity. Um, and as you can see, uh, like the archipelagos and the islands are really high the wilderness um, areas up in northern Emmett County, uh, the Jordan River Valley. These are all kind of intuitive when you see it. Um, you're like, yeah, of course, those, you know, the Michigan shoreline, <laughs> those are important areas, the dunes. Um, but this is just helps remind us that we're not um, chasing down every autumn olive and every, uh, <laughs> you know, buckthorn or spotted knapweed that we need to be more focused. And these are the areas that we need to really to target. So, um, and then one other uh, thing that I wanted to show, um, can you guys see that? Did it switch to the invasion curve? Um, this is kind of what um, I think Dan was referring to as far as um, how the threshold. Um, for management and a lot of uh, invasive species managers use this kind of um, this uh, this graph where we're we're working we want to work in the prevention and eradication phase but a lot of times we end up in the containment phase because that's where people really start to see you know the issue it becomes to the forefront the public awareness becomes but we do really try to focus on the prevention like Lauren said with the the, the boat wash stations, um, 
And our crew does a lot of surveying. They, they walk a lot of miles in the, in the summer looking for stuff. So surveying and inventorying and then follow up monitoring with uh, a lot of these species. So I will, that is all I have to say. And I will entertain questions when you guys are ready. Thank you, Lindsay, appreciate that. Our fourth panelist is Amy Lipson of the Little Travers Conservancy. Amy joined the Little Traverse Conservancy in 2021 in the new position of uh, conservation specialist, drawing on her, on her degree in plant biology from the University of Michigan and her work in Ann Arbor's Parks and Recreation Department in the realm of conservation. Amy is responsible for herbicide use on invasive species on the Little Traverse Conservancy properties. And the Little Traverse Conservancy itself serves to protect the natural diversity and beauty of Northern Michigan by preserving significant land and scenic areas and fostering appreciation and understanding of the environment. So thank you, uh, Amy, for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so I'll jump right into what integrated pest management means to our organization. Um, it means that we're not just relying on one tool when we're controlling pest populations. We evaluate the pest and its impact and we decide which method of control will most likely work the best. So sometimes that means we're manually pulling weeds or performing a controlled burn, spraying an herbicide, planting shade trees or mowing a field. It can also mean that when we use herbicides, we are researching the best management practices, applying the smallest amount of chemical we expect to provide effective treatment, and we are careful in our application in order to reduce off-target impacts. Um, so how is it determined that a pest needs to be eradicated? Um, LTC follows early detection and rapid response methods as well when we're conducting our inventories of properties for invasives. We then evaluate to determine which infestations are at an early stage, both at the individual site scale and at the regional scale. So we prioritize Phragmites, Asian bittersweet, and knotweed because they are regional EDRR species. And we've collaborated collaborated with CAKE in the past to help us treat these species. In general, if a pest population is already very well established, we're not going to prioritize that infestation as highly as we would a new infestation that we think we can control more effectively and sooner. It's important that we control these invasive species because they pose a threat to our preserves biodiversity, their scenic quality, and in some cases even their accessibility. If it's so dense that you can't get through a preserve or if there's um, bittersweet vines, they can really um, impede access. Um, they also take over resources like space, light, water, and nutrients, which makes it difficult for our diverse populations of our native plants and animals to survive and thrive. And also some invasive plants even damage the mycorrhizae, which are the, the Think of them as like mushroom roots that are underground and the native plants depend on them for their survival and reproduction because they connect different plants together and they assist with moving nutrients and water um, in between plants and assist with collection. Invasive plants like autumn olive can also impede the, um, the nutrient cycling that would naturally happen in an environment because they can add nitrogen to a soil and therefore they can create a situation where the native plants are at a disadvantage because they're adapted to those low nutrient conditions, but now all these plants that need those higher nutrients are able to outcompete them. So some plants so some pests are a higher priority for treatment because they're incredibly aggressive and those plants will quickly take over an area and create a monoculture. Those ones are hard to kill, meaning that they require maybe a higher concentration of herbicide to eradicate, or maybe they take many years of repeated treatments to eradicate, or maybe they have a very fast and uncontrollable spread and dispersion. So some of those really aggressive plants might be Japanese knotweed or Eurasian phragmites. Um, we would also highly prioritize treatment of an invasive species if it threatens a very high quality ecosystem or maybe a rare plant or animal. So for example, we're working with the Huron Pines and MNFI in order to control a invasive population of hybrid cattail that is near our threatened dwarf lake iris population in, um, in Duncan Bay in Sheboygan County. Um, mid or mid priority infestations would have um, those are those infestations would have degraded a higher quality habitat, but we think we could control the problem within several years within the scale of our operations. So 
we don't always use pesticides to control those invasive species problems. Um, for example, sometimes we have fields that are full of an invasive plant called spotted naphne. Rather than broadcast a foliar spray herbicide on the entire fields with a chemical that would kill all the plants besides the grasses, we've planted trees in those fields and eventually those trees will shade out in the naphne and convert that field into a forest. This is only an appropriate control method in this specific situation because spotted napweeds already widespread. We're not trying to contain it. Um, and these are specific fields that are adjacent to healthy forests that we'd like to expand. Um, so if we didn't need, if we didn't want that change in the natural community type, we, we wouldn't be able to use this uh, cultural control method as opposed to a chemical. Um, with smaller spotted knapweed populations in an area that we're restoring, we will treat them by spot spraying with a broadleaf specific herbicide. And our herbicide application methods at LTC, including spot spraying, allow the herbicide applicator to get very little herbicide on non-target plants. We're careful in our application and we have tools that allow us to be very careful. Um, Members of the public could help us to make better decisions regarding pest management by letting us know if they notice a rare plant or animal, or if they see a small infestation of an invasive plant, especially in areas with high biodiversity. And so if you're interested in helping with that and volunteering, you could click on the volunteer tab at the top of our website and then scroll down and click Eco Stewards Citizen Science, the tab, and the, it says ways you can help. And um, oh, we don't have chat, so I can't share it, but our website is just landtrust.org. And um, so invasive species infestations, they're like a cancer. If you can catch them early and treat them, you have a good chance of eliminating. But unlike with cancer, you can't just scan all of our properties for infestations. We need volunteers to help be our eyes and ears out on the, I think we have like 22,000 acres of preserved land. So anyone letting us know if they find something um, um, especially rare plants and animals was very helpful in helping us prioritize um, prioritize our um, our efforts to um, control invasive species. Um, there are also some specific situations where we will actually kill some native plants with herbicide, and a, they're very specific situations. So, for example, let's say there's poison ivy creeping onto a trail. We would treat that so that people don't get blisters on their feet, um, but we don't just eliminate poison ivy wherever we find it because it is an essential migration food source for the birds. It has a very high fat content and that gives them the energy they need to fly, south, fly to South America. Um, another situation where we might try to treat native plants with herbicides is when we're creating a parking area so that people can access our preserves. Um, we would spray the area with herbicide down and put on a landscaping fabric. And we're careful in our choice of parking areas so that we're not, um, you know, paving or graveling over a sensitive area. Um, okay. So as far as how we make decisions regarding pesticide use, um, our stewardship staff will assess the infestation. We're going to note the species, the severity, the quality of the surrounding habitats, the sense, any sensitive organisms or natural features that might be impacted. And we're gonna make a judgment on how highly we're gonna prioritize the treatment of the infestation and what the best treatment method is. Um, Amy, if, you got about yeah. a minute. Okay, great. So if it's a pest that we don't already have experience treating, we will consult with other land management practice practitioners in the areas and review the published best management practices to determine the best course of action. For example, our staff doesn't have anybody who has experience treating European, European frog bit infestations. So I attended a presentation by Mike at the Three Shores SISMA on how they manage it. And that way, if we do find it on our, one of our preserves, I already have some background and I know I can contact Mike with questions about that. Um, so I look forward to your questions when we um, when we're done with this. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. That was very informative. And I really like the idea that we can all get involved in this process and this problem by volunteering for the conservancy. Yes, citizen science is very important. Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> and then we're going to wrap up the panel portion of the forum this evening with Erin, who you heard earlier talking about the risks of pesticides. She's going to be addressing the same questions the other panelists addressed. Thank you, Erin. Thanks. I don't want to follow Amy. She did such a great job with her discussion. But um, I came at this from kind of a more general perspective, I think. So working on IPM in schools, IPM in agriculture, IPM in gardening systems and structures, I kind of thought of this from a broader focus. Plus, of course, MSUE does not make applications, we don't eradicate pests, we don't do those things. So we we help people make decisions around those ideas. And so that's kind of going to kind of be my approach here. So um, 
the definition of IPM that I come back to time and time again is this idea of a sustainable approach to pest management and the concept that it takes into account uh, economic health and environmental risks. And I think now as we're moving into this new era in IPM, it also takes into account social considerations, particularly in the, uh, in the context of community pest management or things that go on within our society at large. So pest management is cross-disciplinary. So in my little world, I work with entomologists, virologists, weed managers, horticulturalists, regulators, scientists who work on the toxicity issues. And we kind of all have to come to the table and play nice together because every change each of us makes within a system, whether it's an agricultural system or an ecosystem um, in the natural world, it all has a cascading effect to what um, happens kind of downstream of those changes. And so that kind of cross-disciplinary approach is really critical to what we do. Um, IPM is great, I think, because it's responsive, because it changes over time. It isn't this static concept of like, you spray on the fifth of the month because that's where we always spray. So it's always taking in new information, adopting the latest technology and tools to help us improve our IPM system. Um, so we've covered that it focuses on multiple tactics. Um, it accepts that 100% control is rarely economically necessary or even possible. So it's very rare um, in our pest management world that we're looking to completely eradicate some things. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. There's some exceptions there that some other panelists touched on as well. Um, it encompasses insects, mites, pathogens, and weeds. And one that we often don't think of is vertebrate pests. So whether that's the deer eating your hostas next to your house or um, mice in dwellings or things like that, that those are considerations as well. So we often, I think, think of IPM is um, maybe being you know, noxious weeds or insects, but it's actually a pretty big spectrum when we're talking about pests. So the major tenets of IPM, they like to use this acronym PAMS, P-A-M-S, which stands for Prevention, Avoidance, Monitoring, and Suppression. So uh, prevention encompasses things like mowing weeds before seed heads form so that we don't, they cannot reseed, um, cleaning pruners in between making pruning cuts so we're not spreading disease that way. Uh, avoidance includes things like crop rotation um, in an agricultural field, resistant cultivar planting in a home setting or in a community park type setting. Um, monitoring includes things like trapping, using weather models, visual observation, which Amy touched on that, you know, as, as um, people who are interested in this, your observation of pests of concern can be important. Um, and then the last part of that is suppression. And note that in IPM, we don't say eradication, we say suppression for that last step. And that's because what we're looking to do is reduce the pest population to a tolerable level for the given situation. So whether that's an economic decision that might be made on a farm, an aesthetic decision that might be made in a community park, um, you know, we could use biological control, things like mating suppression, the introduction of natural enemies. I think one of the great new kind of um, concepts for suppression is supporting native natural enemies. So we talk a lot now about supporting native pollinators, of course, honeybees, but also our native pollinators. And a lot of those plantings and practices also support natural enemies. So those go hand in hand, creating that kind of safe space um, sources of nectar and things can really go a long way. So IPM's information intensive, it's science-based, it's practical, it, it considers economic and environmental and social considerations. It's imperfect, it's challenged by invasive pests. Every time we get a new invasive pest, it can really upset the apple cart with these kind of fine-tuned systems that we sometimes have in place. And it's challenged by climate change. So we have um, seen an increase in what in the plant disease world we call wetting periods in Michigan, which essentially means we have a lot more disease pressure in the Great Lakes states than we used to. And so that is something that is challenging a lot of our traditional IPM programs. We also have a global economy. 
we um, oftentimes as private citizens travel internationally, whereas 50 years ago, probably our um, mother's, father's, grandparents did not. We're moving things around at a much more rapid pace. And so that really contributes to some of the challenges. I think IPM is critical to our continued ability to um, have really productive agriculture to supply the food chain in the US. And I think it's also really important to keeping our citizens safe and comfortable in their communities. Eric, so, uh, got about a minute. <laughs> okay, so how is it determined if a pest needs to be eradicated? So again, we don't make that decision, but you know, it's very rare. It's usually impractical and unnecessary. Some exceptions would be um, early in the infestation when it is practical, it's in a small area. Um, if the pest spreads human or animal diseases, so that would be another um, area of concern. And those that infest dwellings or institutions and diminish quality of life or mental health impacts. People don't die from head lice, but nobody wants to live with head lice. Bed bugs won't kill you. Not pleasant to have, right? So we eradicate those pests based on a number of impacts. And then just to wrap it up, decisions regarding pesticide use, in my opinion, should always be economically sound, socially acceptable, legally labeled for the site and the use that you're doing, that you're uh, wanting to utilize it for, and effective on the pest of interest. So those were kind of the highlights of what I came up with. Erin, that was excellent. I really liked the way you wrapped up really uh, everything that was uh, mentioned already. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you have anything more? Or are you uh, available with the rest of the panelists for the questions? I'm available for questions, sure. Okay. All right. I um, really, really appreciate all the panelists and all the participants today. We did have a, a desire that's not going to come to fruition here to have a chat box for the questions. So the questions can be just raise your hand either electronically with your little hand uh, on your uh, Zoom control or your physical hand. And one of our committee members, Mary, will be uh, asking for those questions. Thank you, Mary. And then the panelists, we're just going to leave it kind of open. If you feel as a panelist that you really want to address that, let raise your hand and let Mary will call on you for the answer. Thank you. So do we have any questions? I have a question. Can yes. I ask, can I <laughs> ask it, Mary? Yes, please. Go ahead, um, Rob. What's the best way for a homeowner to know if they have some invasive species or pest that they need help with? Anybody want to take a stab at that? <laughs> I'd, I'd go ahead. Go ahead, Erin. Um, well, we have at ipm.msu.edu, we try to track invasive species, also engaging with your local SISMAs that a couple of them are here, they really help prioritize things, which helps to not be overwhelming, right? So if they have that kind of most wanted list, I always think those are super helpful. And if you have one that you suspect is an invasive, you can send a picture of that to um, an extension agent locally, to your CISMA. And we also have a diagnostics lab on campus that accepts emails and usually does it for free. And will identify plants, insects, a lot of different things for you. So there's a number of resources out there for those that are interested. That's great, thanks. Lindsay, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I would also say um, conservation districts as well are good with um, ID. If you are in the SISMA service area or CAKE service area, um, we can come out. That's one of the services that we do provide is we can come out and look at um, what you have, so. Anybody else? Oh, Dan, do you have a question? I, I actually, I how I would handle that is oh. call somebody very local in your area because it's usually site specific. Um, and from my end of it, and, and, and every individual homeowner has, has, in my opinion, have different wants and needs. And um, I think that all helps out uh, to educate. Now, if there's an invasive species, which I see a lot more and more coming into the residential areas and commercial areas, that's when uh, you get somebody in that specialized field for invasive species, depending on what it is, and before any eradication is 
considered. And everybody on this panel is very qualified, by the way. So I would, that's how I approach it. Homeowner, owner, caretaker calls me, we identify, and then we uh, develop a, a plan based on their needs. And, and I always hope long-term approaches are, 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 are what we need to, to management in the, on an individual basis. Thank you. Robin, did you have something you wanted to say? I saw a hand up for Robin. No. Uh, yep, my hand is up. I always have a question. Um, it seems like a lot of, uh, almost all the speakers are using the principles that um, were spoken about with regards to prevention, avoidance, monitoring, and suppression. That's, you know, the it seems like it's the line of command when you're doing your work. When it comes to the suppression with chemicals, um, because you have chosen or you have focused on, and maybe I'm directing this to Amy and um, and I can't find, and Lindsay, um, because you have a focus on a certain cluster of top priority uh, species, what proportion would you say is a, is a, um, a chemical solution that you need to use or a chemical um, application for, for what you do? How often do you do that? Lindsay, do you wanna take that to start or? Um, as you know, like, are you asking what like portion of the tools does herbicide make up of the tools? That's probably a really much better way of putting it than I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question because when we're talking about IPM, there's a lot of things that go into it. Like this is considered part of IPM by educating people and talking to them. So, <clears throat> The herbicide treatment part of our um, program is actually very small. Um, I believe last this last field season, we treated a total of six acres in the four county area, um, which is pretty small. It's we're we're talking about, you know, like little patches of um, purple loose stripe here, a little, you know, the the knotweed patches are pretty big, but um, I was pretty surprised when I saw that number that it's was six acres was the total output of um, treatment that we did last year. And that was in-house. We do contract out some of the work um, with contractors. And if we, you know, lump that in, it would be probably quite a bit more, um, but it is, it's pretty small part. Um, a lot of what we do is the surveying um, and follow-up monitoring, um, outreach, and yeah, so fairly small. I'm not sure about Amy. <clears throat> Amy, did you wanna add to that? Sure, yeah. So I think that it really depends on the scale that we're operating at. So um, let's say I have an infestation that is, or, or let's say I have an area I'm managing that's 20 or 40 acres large. I'm not gonna be able to treat all of that space effectively with herbicide. It wouldn't be an effective use of my time resources or, or you know, staff time as well. So we'll try to use more cultural control methods when we have larger problems like that. We'll try to manipulate the environment to be more favorable to native plants. If we have smaller infestations, for example, we have a, a preserve that has, you know, this preserve is very, very tiny. It's a uh, sharky nature preserve. And it, it has an infestation of Asian bittersweet. And uh, Brad and I were able to go out there and treat, I think, almost all of the bittersweet there in half a day. If we have an infestation like that, where we're just cutting the stem, applying herbicide with a sponge to the stem, so like a cut stump application, we think we can get that done. Um, you know, herbicide is a better tool when we have a smaller concentrated um, amount of invasive species. So if I come across like a small patch, like a dense patch of invasive Phragmites or a dense patch of uh, knotweed, then I would focus on using herbicide in that situation because it's gonna be extremely effective compared to any cultural control method I might try. Um, Anne, I know at one point you had had your hand up. Are you, do you have any other questions? You're muted. Um, I do, um, but if someone else does, I don't want to hog all the questions here. Marsha, did you have something you wanted to ask? 
You're muted. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that there are handouts with contacts for all five panelists so that if you have questions, if you wanna contact them, save those handouts as a resource. They're available on the website and I think we will pass them along in an email to everybody who registered, but they are available on our League of Women Voters website. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, Anne, I guess uh, you're the only other person that I've seen, unless I'm missing somebody. Sue has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed Sue. Go ahead, Sue. I'm not sure this is an appropriate question for um, this panel, but I'm wondering if you have any advice for homeowners that are looking for lawn care management as ter in terms of what to look for in a lawn care company or what to avoid um, as far as chemical use or managing their lawn or garden. Uh, Dan, would you like to answer that? <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> That's a good question, Sue. I, I, I tackle it all the time, and, and there are different levels of expectations. And I go back to usually it's speed when I'm called. Um, I, again, it, based on the quality of each individual property owner, uh, cost always has a factor to it. Those three things uh, I really consider when it comes to choosing what type of approach is used on your lawn? Um, I think you were talking about, uh, let's say for instance, I know an organic based uh, system on a lawn, home lawn is, is probably desired and, and you hear it over and over again. And I like to say, I don't disagree. I agree, how can we input more organics so then we can feed microbial activity to improve all plant health within your system at your house? The next door neighbor might not care about it anything like that and so how do you individualize each and every property and organics might not always be the best in northern tier climates and here's the reason why the unfortunate part is we live in northern tier climates it's cold microbes kind of shut down and so organics usually build up and then there's a nutrient load what we call a nutrient load and when it comes into uh, play is actually leaching or runoff. And, and those are things that you have to be aware of. It doesn't matter. Um, um, nitrogen is nitrogen and where it goes is out of control when you don't have the control. So that's why a, co a combination of synthetics, uh, maybe just slow released uh, materials for fertilizer and the organics are always important in certain times of the year, but not in high loads because you can build a great system to feed that microactivity. And I'm sorry to bore you with this. <laughs> um, there, there are a lot of things that will help reduce inputs as far as um, pest control, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides are, in my opinion, the worst that we utilize. Um, always the most misused uh, pesticide in, in my business, the turf grass, and they're on the shelves locally. Um, I always go, know what you're doing, read the label, the label's a law. And when you're looking for a company, find out who they work with, how would they fit into your neighborhood or your community? And I don't know where you live, but if I have to travel to Charlevoix, it's probably not the greatest. And therefore your quality will be affected by the cost of me getting over there. So if you're in Charlevoix County, look for somebody who is, um, everybody has to be certified. But I always ask my friends, and that is the greatest way to find out if they fit into your home. And that goes with everything that I do in my practices also. Not everybody's meant to work together, and that's okay. Um, I don't know if that answers your question on how to hire a company. Make sure they're affiliated with, uh, I'm going to toot my own, Michigan State University. Is that all right, Aaron? Can I do that, MSU? Yeah. Go green, all right? <laughs> Sorry if I have offended anybody else, all right? I look at them. In the turf grass world, we are the number one research uh, university in the world. 
seven of those professors teach at least 75% of all research in the world. I always go there too. That's a great resource. Mm -hmm. And again, I look at all your, talk to your friends. This is a great forum, by the way, and it's unique to me because I'm not used to this, by the way. I'm used to hand-to-hand, person-to-person contact. Um, I'm adapting. <laughs> so does Sue, does that answer your question? It, it does. Thank you very much. It's real helpful. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Uh, anybody else have a question? Let's see. Abbott, how about you? Yeah, thank you so much. Great panel. Um, wonderful resources that you're sharing with everyone. My question deals with Northern Emma County, the dunes. Why, why is that such a risk area? Is it because there's so much visitors or why is that a risk area? I can't remember who the speaker was, but they mentioned that it was a severe risk. Why? Is that um, <clears throat> That was me. Uh, so the, the wilderness area is um, a high priority because of the ecological um, value that it, that it holds. Um, it's relatively intact still, and it has um, species that are potentially could be threatened by invasive species. So it's not that it's, um, it, it's invaded, it's that we want to protect it because of the ecological features and um, values that it, have, that it holds. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I guess when we're talking then, in regard to the evaluation of, of Batoski slipped apparently on regard to the, the integrated plan, but Charlevoix, city of Charlevoix has stepped up. C can we get sort of a brief thumbnail discussion or um, appraisal of other governmental bodies in, the, let's say, the cake area in regard to their responsiveness about um, in attention they're giving to these issues? Thanks. Uh, Nancy, I don't know, maybe I direct that to you. Oh, actually, um, you know, our survey has shown, our committee survey has shown um, some communities are doing integrated pest management practices, but they haven't officialized it. And so a resident in that area wouldn't really know where to turn to get specific information. Charlevoix is the only one that we've surveyed that actually has a very official policy. And that's what we would like to see for more communities, but actually, um, Lindsay, are you able to address that? Do you see in, in your four county region municipalities that you've worked with that tend to follow, you know, very strict or, or specific programs of integrated pest management? Um, I haven't worked with the municipalities enough to, to say. Um, I don't know if Katie has any familiarity with that or anybody else, Lauren or um, Amy. Um, so I, I can't say for sure. Thank you. Amy, you, do you have any idea? Um, I do not. I'm, I'm also, like Lindsay, uh, new to the area this year. Um, however, my boss, Derek Shields, is um, he is also on his contact information is also on the handout that I gave and he's a council member in the city of Petoskey so I think he would be the person to go to for questions on that. Thank I'm you. I'm going to jump in here and say uh, we should have no more questions. <laughs> oh okay. We're running out of time. One more person Catherine I don't know so um, all right well thank you so much everybody for all your questions and don't forget um, if you had other questions uh, Nancy you said that um, to give, tell, tell where they can send their questions. Yes. Um, well, I, Robin, I think you're going, you're going to send the resource list to anybody who's registered uh, through their email. Now, if you didn't register and you just joined on a link, you might want to contact uh, us and we can have those sent to you that way. But the website should have it too. Is that correct, Robin? If you go correct. to our League of Women Voters, Northern LWVNLM, did I get that right? Correct. <laughs> It'll be up tomorrow. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone who uh, joined us. There's a large number of people here. It's wonderful to see it's off season. We can start to think about these issues before the, the ground thaws and, and uh, know more about it as we head into the, the growing season. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, panelists. You um, really gave us a lot to think about. And certainly, um, I know I'm not the only one when I say definitely piqued my interest and expanded what I know about pests in our area. And I'm anxious to check out that little Traverse Conservancy link about how I can help because I love the trails. I just want to say a few words about what we have coming up next. Our next event in March is a members and friends event. 
Everyone is welcome. Bring a friend and your favorite beverage. We're celebrating Women's History Month by sharing personal stories about women in our lives that have inspired us, women who have influenced us. Um, they may not be famous, um, but they have had a big influence on, uh, we all have those women in our lives. So we're gonna celebrate them. And in March and April, we're going to be focusing on the upcoming voter protection ballot initiative the, with the aim, uh, its goal is to enshrine secure, uh, accessible and safe voting for Michigan citizens, enshrined it into the constitution. We're gonna be doing public education on the petition and also organizing local petitioners. Everyone is welcome to participate in that, member or not. Uh, info will be on our website in the next few weeks. All right, everyone, thank you for attending and have a good rest of your evening. Bye.